Um, due to the uh, government Lamont's regulations, uh, we are recording this meeting. Um, I also would like uh, to share with the group um, that we are uh, going to be, uh, uh, minutes are being taken. And Peter, did you want to have us take a roll call? And did you want to introduce who our new, in, new and improved uh, note taker is? Sure. Um, we have um, hired uh, some help to pre prepare minutes. So Dawn uh, Geit is uh, on the call with us. She'll be uh, doing our minutes going forward. She's also going to help out with planning and zoning and a couple of other the boards and commissions to uh, take on some of that responsibility. So uh, she's with us today. So Mark, if um, in order to help her with her record record keeping, if you could just, um, I don't know if you wanna call out the names or just go, we can go around and folks to just identify themselves that they're in attendance would be helpful. Sure. Um, Leslie Civitello. Leslie Zier. Tony Martino. Present. Joya Zach. Here. Judy Keene. Here. Morella. I, I can read lips. I think Morella says she's here. Uh, Tom Carson. I'm here. Uh, Tom Pentelo. Here. Patrick Pentelo. Here. Brooke Penders. Here. And as guests, we have Gabe D'Amico. Here. And Cindy. Great. And George. Here. I think that's everyone in attendance. Is that correct? It's the guy, Gary. Uh, Mr. Evans. Oh, my bad. Oh, Mr. Evans, it goes without saying. You started, the, you thought you're top of mind to me. You cut me deep, Mark. You cut me really <laughs> deep. Mark, I just arrived as well. Uh, welcome. Uh, uh, Marco Pace, you are signaling that you are here and present. You're at least here. <laughs> that's right. Okay. Uh, all right, I'd like to call the meeting to, uh, to order. Um, we do have a quorum. We do have a fairly uh, solid agenda here, so let's get right into it. We will have a vote to do. Hopefully everybody received a packet from Peter. Um, we have uh, quite a bit of information on the Lenoche um, facility, a uh, build a business that was uh, developed on Main Street. Uh, they are looking for additional funds. We'll get to that. Um, but hopefully if you haven't read that, you might want to, uh, as I drone on, maybe take a peek uh, at that uh, as we go. Um, so Pete, why don't we just get into uh, project updates? Okay, a couple of quick things. Um, the uh, 140 Salestein Highway, the Popeye's restaurant is um, going through the building permit process. So that should, um, the site work should, if it may, it may have already started. I, I wasn't in the office today, but that is going forward. Uh, you may have noticed across diagonally from town hall used to be the Tim Hortons. Uh, there's a, a bakery going in there. So they're in the middle of renovating uh, that space. You may have noticed the Tilted Kilt building is almost completely demolished now. So that project has started to, to accommodate Chase Bank. Um, looking at my notes here, we have a, a request to amend our zoning regulations to uh, permit uh, breweries and brew pubs in town. Uh, there is uh, an interested party in the Masonic building. Uh, so that is also going through the Historic District Commission at the same time, and they are related projects. Um, and we continue to work with the owner of the uh, auction uh, auction house to try and get uh, some technical uh, assistance going there and, and get a plan going there. So we've been uh, talking to him a couple times every week about that. It's been quiet uh, in regards to the Jordan Lane nursing home. And it's been quiet regarding uh, 1000 uh, Silas Dean Highway. So those are the, those are the big highlights anyway. Um, Tom had provided, Tom Carson, I don't know if you wanted to speak anything to the, on the Bruce side, you were, uh, provided some pretty interesting information. Did you have any question or comment on that? Uh, no, I think the only information was, is that, that when you follow, <clears throat> excuse me, when you, when you, you kind of geek out like I do and watch a lot of these meetings on YouTube, like planning and zoning and the historic district commission, you can get a lot of information about what's going on in town. And um, I did watch the, I don't know if anybody else watched the, the historic district commission meeting, but um, they're all quite favorable. You know, I was a little surprised by just how positive they were, you know, it, it, there's just limited information before the historic district commission right now in terms of what he wants to do with the building. But, um, but 
they seem very favorable towards what he's with what they know he's planning on doing right now anyway i know there are a lot of hurdles to overcome still but uh i just found the whole thing very positive i think beer has a way of being kind of a common uh, a, a peaceful effect on people uh so maybe that's it um peter i know that there's a lot of t's to cross and i's to be dotted on that project um have they approached or talked anything about facade improvement he, he probably will be coming in. He, he's still in the uh, pre-application stage with the Historic District Commission. I don't think he's filed an official application. So I think he's bouncing ideas off of them in terms of how receptive they're going to be ultimately to uh, what he's proposing. Um, so they're really only looking at the improvements to the building. They don't obviously get into the use of the property and that kind of thing. But as Tom said, they have been, according to what I'm hearing, have been very receptive to the conversations uh, that they've been having with him. So, um, so knock, knock on wood. And, and just also, um, there are two other, there are two other entities uh, actively talking to us about uh, brewery, brew pub type operations. So we, we're going from zero uh, to potentially three in, um, you know, in no time at all when we've been waiting all these years for, for one to open. So uh, oh, it's either right. feast, feast or famine, so. Can I ask, is the Masonic, uh, it's still Tapshe or they sold it to somebody else? It hasn't been sold yet, but the idea it would be, it would be sold as part of this potential project. Would they keep the same as in the past, Peter, as far before it comes before us? I was kind of curious or? What, what are they, what's the plan? Is it the same as something yep. in the past? They're still working on the uh, level of improvements that, that they want to make to the property. So okay, so we haven't seen a plan that. yet. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on development uh, project updates from the commission? Okay, Pete, the outreach survey. So it's um, basically uh, about to be sent in the mail. We're going to post um, this the survey on the town website, um, maybe as soon as tomorrow. Um, I was going to ask uh, Deb, I don't, I don't know if Deb from the chamber is on the call, but I was going to ask Deb from the chamber to also help us with the promotion of that by putting an email blast out um, the next time they do that to uh, bring it to everybody's attention and hopefully they um, don't ignore the mailing that we're, we're sending out. So we're going to use social media as well as the uh, postal service to get the word out about the survey, but we're going to put it out there now and uh, let people start filling them out. It is going out in a ton of, a ton of Wethersfield letter, correct? Uh, letterhead, I mean envelope? Yes. Yeah, I think the open rate will be pretty significant with that. Yep. Um, yep. So that's going to be very helpful. Any other questions on the outreach survey? <clears throat> okay, guys. Uh, Pete, the tax incentive program, I know we did have a a meeting on that? Did you want to provide an update? No, just that we did have a, I thought a, a very productive meeting. You know, we, once again, we talked about what other towns are doing. We, we talked about our past practices in terms of tax incentive uh, uh, program in the, the uh, incentives that we've, we've granted. So I think we came up with a, a pretty good uh, proposed um, policy. So I am now finalizing that. It will have to go through the town council process. But what I will probably do is present uh, to the commission at your next meeting, uh, the final version of that before we present it to council and make sure the uh, commission itself is on board with that. But I think we came up with a good um, matrix for recommendations to the council. It's just a matter of me uh, Putting, uh, putting the dots and crossing the T's and all of that. So uh, I will do that in the upcoming weeks, get this finalized. Okay. Any questions on the tax incentive program from the commission? Great. Um, Southstein Highway. Uh, we did have a meeting uh, a week and a half ago uh, with the, I don't know what we're calling ourselves yet. Um, we need to come up, Gabe, you're good at naming things. So maybe you need to come up with a name um, at which was a, a very constructive conversation. Um, uh, the, for those of you that weren't on the call, um, we had um, 
some great participation from uh, Matt Forrest. Uh, and I not really put him on the spot. I just said, you know, we've been, there's been um, studies and whatnot that go back 15 years, 20 years on the South State Highway. What do you think the issue has been uh, regarding um, things not moving forward? And I think Patrick, you added some stuff to that as well. And it basically boiled down to that the inaction on that boiled down to kind of human capital. Um, and that it, it's one of those things that it's a massive job. It's a massive uh, potential. It's a 10, 15 year journey uh, based on what, you know, could be done on the South State Highway. It takes a lot of uh, time. Uh, and um, in essence, at the end of the conversation, and I'm glad it happened that way, we determined that we needed uh, someone beating the drum 24 seven that when they wake up Monday through Friday, uh, they wake up thinking about the South State Highway um, and we talked about some type of a, um, either a, a, cons a consultant or a potential employee. Um, Peter and I had a conversation yesterday regarding this and uh, the town manager has been um, uh, generous enough to start uh, in setting aside a placeholder, which you may have seen in our budget uh, for additional personnel of $50,000. Uh, it's a placeholder. Uh, it doesn't mean that the money will be um, coming for sure. Uh, but it's something that will be submitted. Um, and I wanted to get feedback from the group um, and certainly from Gary, um, his, his perspective, uh, and Patrick um, and, and Peter uh, regarding um, if we have this individual come on, which I'm, I'm, I'm in favor more of having a employee rather than a consultant. Um, I think we've got enough reports from consultant groups that we could go by Already, the South State Highway, in my opinion, I think others on the commission hasn't changed a lot. Um, and a lot of the stuff that was addressed in those original plans, I think, could be addressed and utilized today. Um, so well, there's a $50,000 placeholder. And I think we really need to have an honest discussion, not with that we've been dishonest, uh, but an honest discussion on what it's going to require, what type of um, salary would, would be required. Um, is this a part-time job? Is it a full-time job? Um, I think um, it went back at one point uh, and it was discussed that maybe it could be marketed as maybe just a, a three-year position um, and, and marketed to the council that way. Um, so there could be a beginning and an end. Um, what are the thoughts on the council? And, and I'd, I'd like to just sit back and understand from the group and, and really put you, Gary, uh, on the spotlight on uh, which I knew you knew was coming and tell us what your thoughts are and uh, you know what's what's legitimate? What what should we be? How should we be looking at this? And 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 get your insight, yours and Peter's. Yeah, I was going to talk about it as part of my kind of update. Um, you know, I'm I'm kind of in a difficult spot simply because I don't have a full budget to present yet. Um, we're still in the process of putting numbers together. I've met with every all but one department at this point, so I have a a general sense of where we're at, but I don't have the revenue side coming in to balance me to say where where I fall. I do have other departments that have obviously asked for staffing. Um, I think we can admit that economic development helps an investment in economic development helps offset um, uh, your mill rate potentially because obviously the stronger your economic, uh, your tax base is, the lower your mill rate can be. Um, although it depends upon spending, of course. So, you know, I'm still at that point where I'm trying to fit everything in um, to the request of the department heads and balance the needs. Um, Peter and I have not had full discussions, but obviously, as you and Mark, as you had pointed out, and I know Peter has advocated very strongly, saying I, you'd rather have a person than a consultant. Um, to me, I've got to look at the total budget of the council. Um, I'm not saying. I'm for or against either one of those. I'm just saying that, um, uh, you know, I look at the consultant as a different type of consultant. It's someone who's really just on call, just like our, our legal uh, team is on call. Our corp counsel is I pick up the phone, I call them and they work on a project for me, mm -hmm. not necessarily just doing the study. That being said, I completely understand the capacity issue that Peter has up in planning and how a, a full-time person or even a part-time person, but definitely a full-time person would have a tremendous impact on not just the higher level economic development, but even the, what keeps being called low-hanging fruit 
uh, concept, the, the day-to-day activities that need to get done within that office in terms of responding um, to the needs of the community. So you know, I, I guess the, the long and short of it is, um, I don't have an answer for you today, but I'm happy to engage any questions that you have. Questions from the commission? I don't know, it's Thompson. I don't have a, a question. I just, I'll say a preference. Um, for something like this, I'd probably lean toward, opinion-wise, a, a part-time resource that's, you know, under the town's control, so to speak, um, as opposed to consulting, right? I think I tend to look at consultants as assignment-driven, um, although I think sort of what Gary was referring to was almost a, a retainer type uh, arrangement more than a project. So I guess there's some, I don't know what you would say, it's some hybrid in there, but but definitely not a project-based consultant, but to the point of Mark, constant continuity, always thinking about it. So um, either a retainer or a um, employee type model, I would have a preference for. And, and, and just to be clear, Paul, you, you, that's more my intent than someone who's just like, okay, just focus on this. It would be more like Peter needs to delegate something immediately and they use that resource, the, all resources available, architectural engineering, planning, um, someone to do whatever. Um, but again, I'm not, not picking one over the other. I'm still evaluating both. Um, and, and then it comes down to the cost too, right? Which one can I, which one can I sneak by council? Hint, hint. Well, the secret's out. Pentelope's here. <laughs> uh, we're done. Um, so uh, uh, thank you, Paul. Um, any other questions or comments from the commission? <clears throat> um, the, the, the last comment that I would have is that I think the more successful this person would be, the busier everybody is going to get. Um, the busier Peter will get, the busier engineering will get, the busy uh, this. <laughs> If we're talking about progress on the South State Highway, and it includes construction and, and um, permits and um, uh, grants, or uh, I mean, I just think that person is there to generate activity, and I think that person easily would could move or morph into a full-time position, and I would probably lobby more for a full-time position if we're very serious about it. And I, you know, I I believe that if we can get one significant grant or some type of a significant piece of uh, revenue that this person generates for any projects will more than pay for the investment that the town would have to make um, uh, uh, in this project. So those are my thoughts. Any other thoughts from the commission regarding this individual? We good? Okay. Um, Pete, uh, CIP? Uh, Mark, Cindy, was, uh, Cindy had oh. her hand up. You might have missed her. Uh, Cindy, my apologies. Uh, yeah, I just want to say, uh, express my appreciation to the EDIC and to the town, Peter and uh, Gary, you know, for support for this. And uh, it's just, it's kind of warming to uh, see that there was a budget adjustment proposed and uh, hopefully it's successful. And I think that is going to be really important to the success of this effort. So thanks. Thank you, Cindy. Mark, I, just as I'd echo what Cindy said, and I, I would, my thoughts would be is, is that it, after having been on a few of these meetings, you definitely have to have somebody that has ownership of it and somebody from the inside, a full timer, who would be able to work with the various departments within Weathersfield rather than just committee driven makes a lot of sense. And now it's just um, that, obviously the numbers. So I, I appreciate uh, Peter and uh, Gary working on it. So thanks. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Gabe. Paul, did you have a question? No. Okay, I thought you were raising your hand, I'm sorry. No, I was raising the coffee. Oh, okay, bravo. Um, any other questions or comments regarding Salstein Highway? Mark, did you wanna bring up the DOT yes. email I, I sent you? Thank you. Um, there is, as Peter uh, mentioned, the Capital Region Council of Governments um, has a transportation planning and study solicitation and Pete, I got confused, which is easy for me. Yeah. Is can the town provide one or two projects to this? I the re the region will be able to pursue two corridor studies. So the town, obviously, not being greedy, uh, would probably focus on one. 
uh, probably more than we could handle, more than we can handle. But so uh, the region has two. So I, obviously we would try and get on on that list if if possible. Um, do you want to breathe some more life into this, Pete? Um, and sure. what would be required from us? Yes. So uh, the, the Capital Region Council of Governments uh, acts is, uh, is our regional um, conduit for DOT uh, state and federal funding. Uh, they they are in line to get some uh, funding to, to look at several highway corridors in the region. Uh, as, as we mentioned, the region would be able to access funds for two of those studies. This is completely coincidental. They are soliciting communities to submit uh, a request for funding. These are significant studies. The minimum costs in the in the RFP there are 150,000. Minimum. Um, there's a matching requirement of 20%. So we would, uh, if we were successful, would have to um, come up with a match. Um, However, if we're gonna look at the highway, we would probably reach out to Rocky Hill as well as potentially Hartford. Uh, so we could maybe share some of those matching costs. And coincidentally, I attended a meeting in Rocky Hill the other night and their town engineer said somebody from DOT mm -hmm. had indicated that they might be looking at the highway anyway. So these things uh, seem to be falling into place to a certain extent. So. Uh, I asked the town engineer to reach out to the DOT to see if he could confirm, um, you know, those conversations and get an idea whether uh, this highway corridor would be supported by the DOT for further study. Um, so um, there's a deadline in April, I think. April 20, April 20. Yeah. So there's not a lot of time to pull this together, but we've started to reach out to see if this has some potential. And then obviously we would have to talk about uh, the match and how that would work. Uh, this would be a couple of years out probably, um, but nevertheless, uh, it's an uh, opportunity to access significant funding that we would not be able to uh, undertake uh, on our own. And it's also because it's a state highway, part of the match uh, potentially would also come from the DOT, which would lessen our financial responsibilities. So if it was a $5 million project, they would be looking for a million dollars from the town of Wethersfield. Is that correct? This is just for the study part of it. So um, what the final, you know, multi-million dollar cost would be, would be, you know, remain to be seen and how we would get to that point would be a whole nother, a whole nother round and a whole nother question. But yes, uh, at some point when you pursue these funds, there is another <clears throat> matching requirement uh, unless it's a, a full-on DOT project, which is potentially a scenario as well. So, uh, but in order to get to that point, obviously you have to study the corridor, come up with recommendations um, and go through that whole whole process. So this would start that process. Um, any other hey, questions? questions from the commission? Go ahead. Tom. I have one. Um, do we know if it's just a study or it would be uh, some sort of an initial design or, or um, you know, do we, do we know what would be the result of that investment? I haven't had a chance to look at some of the other studies in the region that have been funded before. They did one in Farmington a couple of years back, but I think it would be uh, a study with some specific design uh, improvements and <laughs> associated costs. So it would be more than just, you know, a theoretical study. It would actually some of them get into you know signal timing and inter so so I it would be uh, not just a study it would it would get into some engineering uh, and get into some costing and in order for it to go on to the next level. Just a question. I it probably I think I know the answer and it, I don't even know if it would apply to Weathersfield, but with trans <clears throat> with transportation include um, railroad. Uh, as well from a corridor perspective, they view that as a corridor by chance? We would we would have to talk about that as to whether it would go beyond, you know, the actual um, Silestein Highway itself and whether we would look at, you know, some of those things. The original Silestein Highway Master Plan did look at some of that to a certain extent and recommended improvements uh, behind the property. So I guess it really depends on how we, how we craft the uh, scope of the study. 
we could certainly talk about it and see if it would make sense to, to be looked at. Okay. Just, um, I mentioned this before in the past and I, I think we have a, a, Peter, if you ever had a, maybe wanted to reach on a resource, like I said, uh, Connecticut CCIA with Don Schubert, you know, he seems to know a lot of stuff. So I don't know if you ever had any questions, maybe he'd be a good resource. Okay, thank you. Okay, restaurant director Peter. I'm sorry. Cindy, want to? Yeah, I just want to just one other thing with the, the Silestein. Um, I did um, reach out to Joe Pascale, who is the head of the um, Old Weathersfield oh, Shopkeepers Association, just to get some idea of uh, what a Silas if if we want to have a Silestein Merchants Association or Business Association, just to get some. Um, just an idea of what their uh, association does and the successes and, and kind of their starting point and what they focus on. So that's probably better shared with the Silas Dean Highway um, uh, pullout committee, but I just thought I'd mention that. Okay. Thank you, Cindy. Any other discussion? Mark, yeah, hey, Mark, sorry, I couldn't get off mute. Well. Cindy raises a good point, and I think we've talked about it in another. Anything that we're doing with the Silas Dean has knock-on consequences in other parts of the town, right? So you do big development on one part of the Silas Dean, it could have consequences or impact on the old Weathersfield area, or I don't know, you know, neighborhoods west of the Silas Dean. Do we need to include some sort of component around that? Uh, what are your thoughts, Pete? Uh, certainly any study that would look at traffic on the Silas Dean Highway would, to a certain extent, um, factor in potential, you know, um, ripple effects on other streets and, and the street network in general. Um, to what extent, you know, we would get into that would, you know, really be based on the recommendations of the, of the study. So, uh, but yeah, they don't, they won't look at the like any study, they won't look at something in, in isolation to what the impacts might be elsewhere. So um, I'm not sure that's a specific or definitive answer, but nevertheless, yes, they, they okay. would. It's like any intersection or any development project. They, there's a certain uh, radius where they go out beyond the localized intersection and look at the impacts on some of the others. Okay. Um, as, a, as a little bit of an aside or departure, if we, if we had a full-time uh, staffer um, on there, would this particular project potentially come under that particular staff person? Yes, just just doing a study like this is becomes you know almost a project on its own as well. So uh, this, if we were to be successful, we would have to designate a staff person to coordinate all aspects of that, and um, so uh, there would be lots of work that would come out of that as well. So I think we need two people. I think we'll start, maybe we'll go for two people, Gary. Pretty sure there was some commitment from that group that I got a person too, as well as Peter getting people, so. Okay, all right. Um, any other questions? Uh, Pete, you covered CIP? Uh, just briefly, uh, the CIP went to the Planning and Zoning Commission at their last meeting. They did recommend uh, approval to the council. Uh, uh, specific to the uh, EDIC, there was funding in there for the uh, uh, plan of development, uh, the affordable housing plan, and the Silas Dean Highway uh, study. Um, they agreed to fund the $100,000 over a two-year period. The first year, there would be $60,000, and then the second year, there would be $40,000 available. Uh, so we'll have to be creative about uh, how we um, set up the contracts so that they do uh, cover two fiscal years. But uh, at this point, uh, that money is in the CIP and then ultimately council will decide the final, uh, the final numbers, but so far so good. Great. Thank you for your work on that, Pete. Sure. Um, any other questions on CIP and the money that we're looking for? Okay. Uh, the restaurant directory. 
So we are uh, slowly but surely uh, moving that along. Denise is putting the finishing touches on the local, um, the local window display, asking people to um, support uh, Weathersfield biz, uh, restaurants at this time with a QR code. So that is nearing completion. And then the bigger project, which is to um, coordinate with our surrounding towns. Um, the good news is that the towns themselves, the town staff have been very supportive of the idea. The chambers of commerce, however, um, on the other hand, have not been terribly supportive. So um, Deb had uh, reached out to a couple of the local chambers, but they um, weren't so wowed by the idea. So we may just focus in on getting the towns, uh, the local economic development commissions uh, being the supporters of this and uh, not, not spend much more time working with the uh, individual chambers. And I can understand the chambers. They, they are a membership driven organization and you know, non chamber members would be promoted in this whole thing. So I can certainly, to a certain extent, understand uh, you know, their trepidation, but uh, nevertheless, we will probably not spend a lot of time working with the chambers and we'll focus in on uh, the individual towns and see what level of commitment they all are willing to make. And then obviously we'll bring it back to you guys for another conversation about you know, what, what level of involvement we will have. So there is progress, uh, of, although slow, but we're gonna get the, uh, we're probably gonna finalize the local, the local piece uh, next week and get that out there, so. Okay, thank you, Pete. Um, okay, 285 uh, Main Street, which is the La Noche's Italian Kitchen. Has everybody got a copy of the, in the packet and reviewed that information? Um, the one, I mean, I, uh, the original stuff we used to get from La Noche was kind of written on a napkin, Pete, at the beginning. Um, and I have to give them an A plus on the information that they've re, re that they've submitted to us it's extremely detailed um, pictures and uh, touch points in it. Um, so before we get into that, if you wanna just encapsulate Pete, um, what they're looking for, I know everybody's got their cover letter, but if you just wanna be on record on what they're looking for, um, and then we can have a discussion. This is the... Uh second uh, effort if you remember some some time ago they initially came in and we started a conversation but the information that they had submitted was um you know inadequate uh, for processing it any further um the the bottom line is that because of the project delays because of the um what they found when they opened up the building and the associated costs um and obviously uh, another factor was COVID. They are asking the commission to uh, consider uh, providing them with some additional funds based on the uh, updated costs that they've provided. Just to refresh your memory, um, when we first granted them the funding back in 2019, they had provided us with costs that were about 75,000, I think. And some of those costs um, were associated not just with the front facade, but the sides and the back. So the commission decided to give them a kind of a different percentage rather than the 50-50, you ended up giving them 25,000. When they uh, went back and tallied up all of their costs, uh, they are now indicating that the total of all of the exterior uh, improvement is 66,000 on the facade. Well, no, I'm, just I'm talking about everything. The total? I got so much paperwork here now with this project that I'm kind of losing my, uh, it's- um, 141? Yeah, 141. Hard look at, at those numbers. Um, I could, I could, oh, I could desert for just for the front facade, when I add, added everything up the way they'd accounted for it, I came up with uh, specifically and legitimately for the front facade, I came up with a total of 78,000 out of that 141. 
Um, and then for the other work, which was another 63,000, some of it was for the front, but you know, there was a roof line item. Obviously you can see the roof from the front, but not the whole roof. You know, there were some gutters for the whole building. There was, there were some windows on the sides. There was some other labor by their contractor. So a, a, probably a smaller percentage of that is legitimate for the facade. Uh, so looking at the two of them, uh, so the 78,000 that is legitimate for the front, the 50% of that is about 39,000. We already, um, as I said earlier, gave them 25,000. So there's a Delta there. And then if you plugged in another percentage for the other work, a smaller percentage, you know, I was thinking maybe another another 12,000. So I, I was kind of thinking that based on all those numbers. Um, 90,000? Well, I was thinking maybe 15,000. Oh no, you know? uh, you're talking on the, the additional facade number of 66,000, yeah. you were taking 20 right. or 25% of that? Just for the front stuff and the other stuff, since it covers other parts of the building, you may want to just be careful and stay away from. So, um, but that's just, you know, my two cents. As I said, they, when they first came in uh, and when we got close to the closing, they really didn't provide me with uh, the additional numbers that they've now provided us with. Um, but as, as you said at the beginning, it's a very detailed proposal uh, and provides, you know, all the numbers that we previously didn't have. So. Questions from the commission or observations? Yes, Mr. Carson. Peter, is there any precedence through the history of this program where um, an applicant has come back a second time to request more money once a project is completed? This is a new, new territory and I've explained that to the Linoches that this is uh, unprecedented in terms of uh, other projects. You know, no one's ever come back and then I was you know, concerned about that, opening up that box. Um, but, you know, there are some extenuating circumstances. If you look at some of those photos, they basically demolished the whole building. And, and that really wasn't what, when they did the original cost estimates, that really wasn't the plan. So uh, once they got into this, they opened up a hornet's nest and, um, you know, it became a much bigger project. You know, it was a hundred and whatever it was, $41,000. And that's just for the outside stuff, Never mind the inside work that um, is unrelated to the facade. So, um, but yeah, this is unprecedented. We've never uh, had to deal with this before. So, um, and they've been, they've been told that. So I, it, it, that it was definitely a reach um, and that we have to be careful, you know, when we do something like that so that it doesn't come back. So if we are gonna do that, there has to be, I think an indication uh, in the motion um, that how unusual and on, on, you know, not, not, not the standard course of action. Judy. Um, so my understanding is that they have received $50,000. 25, 25,000. Okay. And our max that we would give out is 50,000 to any business. That's correct. Okay. Um, you know, I kind of feel, I, I was thinking that they had gotten the max already, but um, <clears throat> this is a very small building and a small business. And it was their choice. And I believe they owned the property to begin with. Yes. And it was their choice to totally gut it and start all over again and make it a beautiful little building. But I, I don't know. I, I have difficulty with them coming back for more. I did not realize that they had not gotten the 50,000 though. Yeah, just to, just to correct that, it wasn't their choice to completely gut the building. Once they got into it, uh, given the age of the building and the structural, the way it was built, they really didn't have a choice uh, and didn't realize that until they got into it. So a lot of these costs were uh, significantly uh, upgraded because of the conditions that they found once they got into the uh, the building itself so uh, and at that point they couldn't couldn't turn around so um but so again it, it, they are it is what they it already is. owned it it was theirs that they had let it go all those years 
Well, I wouldn't say they let it go. It was just once they opened up the walls, they realized there wasn't much to the building itself. So uh, yeah. it wasn't a maintenance, necessarily a maintenance issue or lack of maintenance. It was really code. Um, bringing things up to code is really the issue on, from what I understand on that building. And, and uh, the, his, the historic, it's obviously in the Historic District Commission. The Historic District Commission, as many of you know, if you've dealt with them, ha has certain requirements that uh, unfortunately raise the costs of the project. And in this case, there were several elements of that that um, they had no choice but to comply with the HDC's requirements. So there's always that factor uh, as well when you're in Old Wethersfield. I'm just afraid that if we um, up the ante, uh, first of all, there will, this is now setting a precedent. And second of all, we don't have a whole lot of money for future facades. And, um, you know, I'm hoping maybe this brew pub, they would like to do some uh, facade improvement. There may be other uh, customers that would, you know, people that have businesses in Old Wethersfield that would like to do it as well. Sure. Or not on the Wethersfield, in Old Wethersfield, it might be somebody on the South Dean that would like to do that, you know? Just as a follow up to that, we are, um, I didn't mention during the CIP line item, we are getting another 50,000 July 1st through, through the council, the CIP. So um, we are um, getting a little breather uh, and some additional funds for the program. What does you that know, bring what, us up to? Yeah, good question. Um, that's a good question. I'm still waiting for a final uh, report from the finance department. I don't know how many months I've said this now. I'm, I'm embarrassed to say it any further, but we have, um, over a hundred thousand, depending upon the number I'm getting. So, and we may have significantly more than that, depending on who's doing the accounting. So, I, but I will. I feel confident telling you there's a uh, probably a hundred and ten thousand without question, and there's maybe another forty thousand. So, and have we had any applications recently? No. Once again, there's people out there we've talked to, and I'm once again, knock on wood, we're hopeful they're gonna come in, but at this point, there's no pending applications. Um, so we've been in kind of a low, we haven't issued a new one in quite a while. I think the last one was the um, up on the Berlin Turnpike for the uh, Tough Shed building. Those last- I think we approved that pre-COVID. Yeah, I think it was. Uh, I think it, we approved it in 2019, so that was the last one we've approved. So we're almost we've almost gone two years without granting a new one. And I'm hoping that Charles is going to come in with a request soon. Peter, out of the estimated 110,000, you think is in there? Is it have they already removed the 25,000 that we've already committed to them? Yes. Or is that still? Yeah, in? that's separate. So that's. The, the, the quote that I gave you is uh, unencumbered funds available to whoever uh, whoever would want it. So in other words, if we, you know, using round numbers, if we wanted to give the other 25 and it was 100 in there now, that would reduce it to 75. So, and then it would go back up to 100 and a quarter after the 1st of July. Yeah, as I, as I said earlier, I could, I could um, easily justify and defend if you wanted to give them another 15. Anything above that, I think, you know, might be might be even even more questionable. My um, I think the the use of that money over the next year to eighteen months may be very limited of the facade money because the cost of construction has gone through the roof. Uh, labor's gone through the roof. Uh, sheetrock has gone up seventy five percent. Plywood has gone up almost three hundred percent. I mean, just the basics. It's insanity right now. To get uh, to build anything, the budgets for anybody's budget has doubled, frankly, just on material. And also, the just trying to get labor out there is very difficult. Everybody's super busy right now you know, with projects and whatnot. We're one. I mean, we we've, we've had a guy that basically moved into our house um, and all the stuff that we're doing. But so I'm not sure even how active we would be on that facade improvement if somebody really stepped up right now to do it. You know, the most compelling thing to me is that if you look on page eight of the document um, uh, that Peter sent out, um, there's a picture there in the middle of the document, and it basically just shows basically two walls left standing up on that entire structure. Um, in essence, they built, it's a new structure. Everything's new. I mean, they kept some of it, I think, from a historic perspective. I don't think they could knock some of it down. I think they had to hold on to some of it. So... I, I feel their pain. 
I'm, and, and Judy, I think that was a good question that you asked. Was this something regarding maintenance? Um, it really wasn't. I think whoever built that building back in the day um, slapped it up rather haphazardly. And just to bring it to code structurally, um, they had to do basically start anew uh, on that. Um, any other questions or comments um, from the commission? Tom. Um, I would just say that I'd be opposed to giving them any more money. I think based on the size of the building and the, I don't, you know, I, I, I don't know during the life of this program, I've only been on the commission a few years. I know it predates me by probably a decade, but to give, since $50,000 is the max, you know, if somebody wants to do $150,000 improvement on a building that might cost $100,000 or $300,000, it's a lot different. You know, then somebody could come in with a $10 million building and want to do, you know, a million dollars. But the fact that they're capped at $50,000, I think, um, you know, you know, just based on the size and the scope and the importance of the building and everything else, I'd just be reluctant to give them any more money uh, just based on the construction issues that they've had because they have essentially built a new building. They haven't just improved the facade. It's a, it's a, it's a brand new building. And I don't think that's what necessarily what this program was intended for. So. Judy, thank you, Tom. I, I, let me just restate what I was saying earlier. Basically, I think they took a shed and made it a brand new building. And I don't think that that's really our place to um, reimburse them more than they had asked for originally. Um, but I will leave it up to the group. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Peter, so a lot of the work was to make the building now more structurally sound, correct? Uh, structurally sound and code, code compliant. Right. As Mark said, they took the entire roof off so I think it was two walls, maybe three walls at one point based on what they found when they opened up the wall. So uh, yes, it was, uh, it was almost a complete reconstruction, but they had to keep you know, some of those walls to comply with zoning and, and the historic district commission, so. I mean, cause you gotta take into consideration even when we did the um, tough shed building, we, had, we gave them some money towards you know, putting the carrying beam inside because of the change, because of the windows going in and stuff. Yeah. So it, it was to bring it up to code as a result of the change. And I sounds like this would be the same thing. Just a comment. I think it's a good comment. Peter, do we know what the, what the new assessed value is of that building? Um, I do have that somewhere, but I, I wouldn't hazard a guess to, to throw that out there on the record. But um, the overall, they, between, you know, they, they, they put in over, maybe even closer to 400,000 by the time you're they're done with equipment and everything that went into that project. So uh, it's a significant investment by this family. So um, I'm very, uh, and they opened up during COVID. So for a whole number of reasons, I'm, I'm very uh, sympathetic and uh, do, do support uh, helping them if, if you guys can at all. Um, in light of, um... Uh, COVID uh, construction cost. Um, I, I wish I knew the assessed value, what the, the value of the building was um, prior to what it is now. I mean, half of it was a hair salon. So I know that the value of that wouldn't be anywhere close to what it is per square foot as a full service restaurant. Um, but I think we're going, obviously there's going to be a tax difference to the town with the improvement of that property. I don't know if it's $5,000 a year or $10,000 a year. I have no idea. That's why I wish we had that. Um, I, I think I would be in favor of granting them um, uh, more funding, but I think I would like to know what the assessed value is, what the building was assessed at and what it is now to find out if there's, you know, if we're recouping, you know, from a tax mm -hmm. perspective, certain more money from property taxes and there's equipment tax that they're going to have on that building as well. Um, I can probably pull that up on the on the town website, at least for the real estate real quick. I, I don't know what the previous uh, number, right you, you're doing that, Gary? I'm trying to, yes. Okay. Computer's taking a little bit longer than expected. 
there'd probably be a significant increase in the personal property uh, yeah. tax as well. Yeah, the, from what it was the, to what it's going to be. Some of the equipment that they have in the kitchen is um, very significant. So, but that won't be on the that won't be available on the website. You'd have to we'd have to request a, a report from the assessor's office. I'm getting there. It's just for some reason. Oh. Some reason my computer is lagging. Any other questions while uh, while we while Mr. Evans is doing his research? Any other questions on this or or comments? I, can I just say one more thing? I mean, I do think we have to think about the precedents as well that you might have 15 years of applicants coming back and looking for more money. I mean, it might be a stretch, but it's something to think about. No, I, I, I think that's a, I think that is a, a, a very salient point. It, it can become a slippery slope, Tom. I agree that if you do make an adjustment, um, uh, but I also believe that if you, um, if the motion is crafted properly and say that this is purely a, a one-off and not a standard operating procedure and how the facade improvement funding is yeah. utilized, we could probably have something to be able to go back on. Um, I guess the way I looked at it was if Lenoches had come back to us originally and said, look, we're gonna to need to take down the roof, two walls. Um, it, structurally, we've been told we've done, we've gotten information that this can't be saved. And they went through and said, look, just for us to bring it from a safety and construction and code perspective, it's gonna cost us X amount of dollars to do that. And they were upfront and we knew about that up front, would we have given them additional funding if they had made that case um, originally? I don't know. I mean, I, I put it out there, um, but it is basically an, a new facility. And my guess is they didn't want to put a new roof on this. I don't think they wanted to do any of the stuff that they did. Um, I've been in this position, not in this position, but position similar. Um, I don't think anybody was looking to do what they did because they, with the amount of money they spent on that restaurant recouping that funding, it's a long project. And Peter, I don't know if you said that, was it 400,000 that you thought they put completely in? That? Yes, yes. That's a lot, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a lot of grinders. Uh, it is. And, and assuming I'm looking at the right card, because for whatever reason, the computer keeps giving me a glitch. It looks like the current assessment is 449,000. And if you go back, it was slowly incremented up from 383,000. That's the assessed. So, you know, gross set up 70%. Um, you know, so you're, you, again, it, it's tough to tell. And plus you don't also see the, uh, the equipment and the value of the impact of uh, people going there. But you're probably a $100,000 swing at least as of now in property value i mean i know the pizza oven like i don't know if somebody if you told me it was 40 grand um uh, for the for the pizza oven which you got to really be committed to your craft to make that investment well um i would say i would be in favor and and, and i would probably uh uh put a motion forward uh that we would provide lenoche um, I think you said 15,000, Peter. I'd like to split the difference down the middle. I know they're asking for 25,000 um, is, to, is to provide Lenoche 12,500 for additional expenses that they've had uh, on that project, but also to be on record that this clearly is a, uh, a specific situation to them, that, that this was because of um, some of the hardship that they've had on that particular uh, property and that this is something that isn't our normal approval uh, and our, coming back for money isn't part of our normal uh, approval process. So I would make that motion. I'll second it. Can you couch that as a COVID response? Um, I have two things, COVID and construction expenses is what I have here for the two items if we wanted to add that, but uh, the short answer is yes. I mean, this is a also a facility that had to sit around for a year uh, and not be open. I mean, it was horrible timing. And again, that's not that's not our responsibility as a group uh, to take that into account. Uh, but that is possibly something that we could use to um, uh, 
to provide them additional funding. I would support that. Uh, Tony, you second it? Yeah. Mark, what are we what are we actually voting on? That's all. I just um, just to, we're only going to give them twelve five, or can we vote give them nothing or give them the full twenty five? Um, the motion it's is to um, well, we can have comment and questions on it, uh, Tom. The motion that I have is that we provide them twelve thousand five hundred dollars, which is in addition to the twenty five we already committed to. That's right. correct. All those uh, do, it, I, I, I've gotten it backwards, it's been so long. Do we have discussion before a, a, a vote or a vote? We have, okay, discussion, please. I, I would say that um, I, I would be not in favor of giving any more money. Just my opinion, I, I love the place. I think good people, it's just, I, I just feel like uh, exactly what Tom said and a couple others were, were setting precedent and We've already given quite a bit of money, uh, and I do. I feel bad with COVID and all that stuff, but there's got to be other people that need it just as much in town uh, that I'd like to use it for. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Judy. Again, I'd just like to reiterate, it's a small building. It was theirs. They owned it before, and uh, they went over the top with renovations, and uh uh, even just the patio and everything is really over the top. So I, I would say I would vote no. Okay. Thank you, Judy. Any other questions or comment? Okay. We have the motion for all those in favor say aye or raise your hand. I think I see three. And those opposed? I think I see four or five. Okay, the motion does not carry. Um, all right, thank you guys for, uh, for your time on that. Um, all right. Social media programs, Peter. So we, um, we had a... We had a marketing committee meeting a couple week or two ago uh, to uh, refresh our social media uh, initiatives, uh, had a lively discussion. Um, we've had some follow-up uh, since that point in time. Tom has provided some thoughts about how to uh, liven up our social media presence. Uh, Denise is um, taking that under advisement and trying to uh, kind of reactivate our social media presence. We've already seen an uptick in followers uh, in the last week or two, which is great. Um, uh, Marco also had some ideas on how we can further uh, make improvements. Maybe I'll uh, let you two guys uh, jump in. And before I forget, uh, Mark, I think there was an email from Marco to you about the SSL certificate. Yep. Um, yep. So if um, you could make a note to uh, follow up with that. Uh, that was an, that was also an agenda item that we uh, we discussed. So uh, I'll be quiet now and let let those two guys uh, jump in here and uh, uh, provide their own thoughts on that. Please do. Tom, you can kick it off if you'd like. Uh, yeah, I don't really have a lot more to say, Peter. You, you summed it up pretty pretty good. I mean, I think you know, in order, if we're going to have social media accounts, they have to be active. You know, it doesn't mean you have to tweet or post on Facebook 15, 20, 30 times a day, but it is good that even if it's, sometimes it's not even once a day, but it's just about getting out there and, you know, showing pictures of vacant properties or sharing real estate listings or showing construction in progress, because there's, I just think in, in town, there's a lot of people who don't really know what's what's happening. And, and you know, you go on some of these social media sites, you know, or the, the group sites, like what's going on Weathersfield and um, people are always asking questions about what's going in there. Or wouldn't it be great if we had one of these things here? And 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 um, so it, it the other thing is, is that the Hartford Current is disappearing before our eyes and um, you know, this is the way people are getting their news now. You know, we're not going to get we're not going to get stories written about things um, as much as we might have in the past. And um, so, 
we use Twitter and Facebook. It's a way that we get our stories out there and people can comment however they want to comment if they're in favor of a project or they're not in favor of a project, but it's just uh, because we don't really have great news coverage in town. We don't have a local newspaper that's, that's really covering the heck out of us that this is the way we need to, um, in, in all aspects, not only EDIC, but you know, other, the, the town itself, Parks and Rec, you know, the police department does it, fire department does it. This is the way people get their news these days. And so if we want to promote activity in town, we really got to, you know, be active on social media for better or for worse. Yeah, just to, to extend some of that also, um, you know, one of the other big conversations we had, uh, Jesse was able to join us and we were talking a little bit about the Great Elm as it relates to social media. So, the, you know, the deal nowadays is um, as much as we want a lot of traffic on the Great Elm website, uh, there's no doubt we want that. That's something we're after. Um, Tom's 100% right. Um, information moves a lot faster, not in direct websites, um, but more through social media. Now, that said, we need a combination of both. Um, we need social media to drive results and traffic to our pages, right? And to do more of that and to make it more engaging. Otherwise, the website by itself really doesn't live and breathe very well. Um, we need to, you know, ideally, it would be great to, you know, keep doing what I think Jesse had started doing, um, which is getting some posts out there on behalf of certain um, events, uh, programs that are hosted on the Great Elm, um, to really try to cultivate and make that more of the final repository, um, but, I, but we need to do more on social media, as Tom said, with even just regular tweets, as he said about, it could be about anything. It doesn't have to be about something that's you know, breaking news this week. Um, many people don't know a lot about the basics of this town. Um, I've said it for so many years. And so even if it's um, once every couple of days, whether it's Jesse or someone else, just something that is always out there constantly putting some new little tidbit, some little fact, some little um, piece that links them back to Great Elm potentially or elsewhere for that matter. Um, one of the topics um, that we were talking about also, I had just brought up a, a potential idea about, um, and, and this, you know, this can kind of go here or there or wherever, it doesn't have to necessarily happen, but it was about having more active uh, video engagement in terms of having video clips from a lot of business owners from around town you know, 30 second, 45 second clips, um, brand our own YouTube channel, uh, make it more of a video sensory experience um, where, you know, it's basically, you know, it's kind of like, you know, where the, you know, when the onion's going around town, right? When Jesse is doing his piece, um, but get video clips from different restaurants. Um, give us their 30 second, you know, elevator pitch, um, get it up on YouTube, get it up and share it through Twitter, get it up and share it through the Great Elm and kind of use these tools together. Um, YouTube obviously provides that sensory experience that I think a lot of people are looking for. Um, it's much more of a multi-dimensional experience than just reading text on a page. Um, I would love to see it from this uh, standpoint. I, I had given the analogy to something that's done in the hockey world that I'm a part of, especially with youth hockey, where it's, it's, uh, there's a segment called Connecticut Loves Hockey. And they go around to different ice rinks all over the place. So my thought, just as an analogy, was, you know, we go around to different restaurants and or different businesses. Any any business really would be in play here, to be able to provide more exposure, to be able to have something new to tweet about. Um, but it has to be cultivated, right? So we have to keep feeding it new content. Content is king on the web. It's king in social media. Um, but I would love to get more businesses and give them more exposure, especially a lot of younger, newer businesses that people don't know as well. And give them more exposure through YouTube, through our social media, through you know Twitter or where, what have you, but somehow really combine the two then with the Great Elm. Again, the Great Elm would be we'd have a YouTube channel, we'd have a, a more vibrant uh, Great Elm, if you will. Um, we would try to get ourselves listed higher organically, you know, for for Weathersfield listings uh, with Google and Bing and other search engines. And, and little by little, really start to, to spin the flywheel a little bit. Um, so right now, I think we're kind of doing it a little bit passively. It's, it's not bad. We, we've started. Um, but I think we want to be more engaging. And my, my thought was really to get a lot more video engagement. Because um, I feel like a lot of businesses, even though they do it on their own, it would be kind of like, you know, the, you know it's, it's like, you know, we love Weathersfield type of thing. But 
but really be able to highlight these businesses and organizations. And it could be organizations too, right? So it could be any, any part of, of Weathersfield really for that matter. So we had a little bit of discussion about that as well. Yeah, I, it's, it's Paul, I have to drop, but just one comment, Marco, 110% behind that. I, I was looking at a Instagram site, Historic Weathersfield CT. I don't know if that's who maintains that. I don't know if that's town or, or the association. I mean, yep. it's just fantastic. You look at those pictures and you're like, holy cow, I got to visit this place. And it's a connection to the to the a web link. And then it's got like, Judy, a picture at a Cove Carnival. I mean, you look at the picture, you're just like, holy cow, this is somewhere I've got to see. So, um, you know, the more I think we do that, and I'll tell you, if some of that was video, that would really, that would be eye-catching there. I agree, Paul and Marco. Um, and as someone who runs a university career center, and um, we're about to institute required experiences and internships, this could be a really unique opportunity to find some Weathersfield homegrown college students that maybe this summer or this spring, we could turn it into an internship. I could help structure that in a way that will attract the best students, maybe even offer it for credit or something with the right number of hours and the right description of what's expected of them and the deliverables. So um, I think it'd be a great way to celebrate the talents of Weathersfield youth, give them some real world experience and, and as Marco said, drive quality content. Thank you, Brooke. And one thing I neglected to mention, is that in our conversation, um, Joy and I were gonna actually be approaching and talking even to our local high school. Um, and I forget the woman's name, Joya. I don't know if you can remind me of her name. Uh, we haven't done it yet, but we need to reach out to this woman. It's Sue Coco. She um, was the one behind like Blue Eagle News and-, and Oh, that's right. Uh, that's she's right. in the art department in, in the school, so. Yeah, so we we're, th we're thinking also, Brooke, about leveraging some of the the local young, you know, people as well. Um, it, you know, can be anyone, I love, I love your idea too. I mean, it can be at the collegiate level. It can be at the high school level. Uh, maybe it helps bridge the gap between the two. Excellent. Uh, obviously, I agree. Anything to do with the Great Elm, we 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 hold near to heart. So, my question is, where do we get the content, Marco and Tom? I mean, who becomes the conduit for that? I, I know you say content is king. How do we get that content? How does it get to Jesse or whomever? And how do you make the outreach to the people to provide the content? Because the concept is great. How do we enact it? So I think it needs to be, it really needs to be storyboarded and scripted, you know, in some, some way first. Um, and I think to Brooke's point and to the you know, points Joy and I were talking about with the group, um, so you'd script it and storyboard it in a way where you can essentially, you know, pre-script and give questions to whatever that business or that program is. Let them know that, you know, somebody will come on site. Honestly, this is, a you know, somewhat of a homegrown effort. We're not talking about professional videography here, um, but I think we're talking about, again, capturing a sensory experience to provide more exposure. If we ultimately build a, a bigger list of people, right, if we've got the list in MailChimp or wherever else that we can broadcast messages. And as we grow a, a following, according to like what Tom was saying, and people start to rely on us, then I think, um, you know, maybe we change the game at that point. But for right now, I, I look at it more as a homegrown approach. Um, so I'm physically talking about, you know, it could be that college student or two, or a couple of high school students from Blue Eagle News that, that go out, they meet with that program or that business owner. Um, they take a, you know, a few different video clips take the best of, splice them together, and that becomes their, their push. That becomes their thing. Um, it gets uploaded to the YouTube channel, and now that becomes the primary repository for all the videos. So we end up having our own EDIC or you know town or whatever it might be channel. And then when Tom or somebody else, Jesse, anybody wants to tweet about it, they're gonna reference those videos coming out of YouTube. And somehow, some way, we wanna push them and provide links back to those same programs in Great Elm. So that's how I'm, I really try to connect these dots a little bit. You know, you don't wanna just have social media. You don't wanna just have the website. You don't wanna just have MailChimp, you know, email marketing. You kind of need a combination really. Um, uh, they, they, what do they call it now? Uh, Tradigital marketing, I think is what they're calling it. <laughs> right? So it's a combination of traditional, you know, offline versus, and, and then combining that with digital. So Tradigital is the, the latest you know, buzzword that people have been talking about. 
um, something along those lines. Mark, I'm surprised you haven't grabbed that uh, web address yet, tradigi uh, traditional.com, unless you have. <laughs> no, not yet. I'm sure somebody's already taken it. Any other we need questions? Some we need some bodies. We need some people involved. We need to, again, get a small plan together. And I think just hit the ground running. Um, I think Tom and I um, share a lot of the same kind of feelings on this with regard to, you know, don't, don't you know, don't let you know great be the evil of good, right? Get started, move it forward, improve it, make take baby steps. But whatever you need to do, let's walk a little bit. We'll start to jog, and then eventually we'll start to really run. Um, I think it can be done, but we do need some people. Much to Brooke's point, and again, the conversations Joy and I had as well. So, consider me in and helpful in any way I can be. Thank you, Brooke. Great. Thoughtful, uh, in, uh, thoughtful insight, uh, Tom and Marco. Thank you. Any other questions or, or comments or observations um, regarding social media? Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Peter. Our budget for twenty one twenty two. Well, you should have gotten a, a supplemental email with the uh, proposed budget for uh, this coming year. Um, as we discussed at the beginning, we. have Put a placeholder in there for additional personnel. We'll have to have a separate conversation about how that uh, gets finalized and presented to the council. But there is a, a fifty thousand dollar line item uh, in the budget. Uh, we've got um, money for the recording secretary. Uh, we've got money for the town calendar next year. Uh, we've got money for our advanced CT membership. Uh, money for our Great Elm slash social media program. Shop Weathersfield, uh, continuing the welcome wagon, ribbon cuttings, some meeting supplies, assuming we have meetings again. Um, breakfast meetings, we've got a line item for that in case we do wanna do an educational uh, breakfast get together. And then lastly, a line item for our salute to business. Uh, all of these line items, uh, except for the additional personnel and the commission clerk are the same numbers as last year. So those are the only two uh, additions that we've added to the budget. The other numbers remain the same. Peter, of the social media, the Great Elm social media budget for Jesse, um, I mean, that's basically uh, paying for Jesse's services, correct? Correct, yes. Do you know how close he's come to using that 6,000? Um, he'll probably be a little bit shy by the end of the year. Um, I would project him to be maybe around 5,000 this year. Okay. Um, so, so if we want to tap into him for more of that social media conversation, uh, and he does have those um, skill sets. So uh, that might be a, a, a short-term solution to start thinking about tapping into him to get him to do some of those things. Well, that was, you're, you're, you're reading my notes. I was thinking if we need people and whatnot, and he has a flair for that, and obviously he's in charge of Great Elm, is, is from a budget perspective, we've already proposed this budget, right? There's no, has this already been submitted? No, this is, I'm waiting for you guys before I finalize it. So uh, if there are changes, now would be the time to advise me of that. Yeah, I mean, I think if we would, if we could potentially, utilize, and I don't know if Jesse would be interested or if he would have time to commit to it, I, you'd have to answer that, or I don't know if you can speak on that on his behalf, but if we could utilize his talents and, uh, and know that we could potentially go over that $6,000 number, now would be the time to, to think about that, right? Yeah, so I think if, if we're talking about an expanded social media campaign, then that number would have to be increased a little bit because uh, we have, um, I think we increased it last year for the first time in a while. And uh, as I said earlier, he's, he's, he's probably gonna be shy of the 6,000, but uh, if we add social media responsibilities to that for next year, uh, he's probably gonna be over that next year. If we were to increase that line item, Peter, what do you think it would, what do you think a reasonable number would be? I mean, you wanna be careful of sticker shock to the town council, but uh, so I, I, I noted maybe 2,000 more. 
And then obviously if we could tap into, you know, talented high school and or um, college kids, interns, that kind of thing, we could stretch those dollars uh, a lot far farther, so. Any, any questions or comments from the commission? Yep, Leslie. I was wondering uh, from this year, so last year, was there anything left over? Well, we're not quite there yet. So um, we probably, you know, we never had any meetings. So there's meeting supply money. So there are some line items in here that we have just did not tap into because of the pandemic. So we, we will not expend, um, and we didn't do the salute to business, although we bought the awards. So, um, so there's a few thousand there as well. So yeah, there is some, there are some resources this year that we could tap into before the end of the year. Not that, you know, I'm advising that we spend all of our money since the town manager is on this call, but if we have the resources and they're in our budget, they're there, you know, for those programs. So do we get to carry them over or no? No, oh, okay. not unless we have a specific a uh, purchase order for a contractor or something like that. But no, we don't, we can't carry them over unless it's, um, you know, specifically set up for uh, a service or supplies or something like that. Any other questions? Anybody would like to make a motion regarding uh, anything? Mr. Martino? You're on mute, Tony. You're on mute, Tony. Uh, sorry about that. With this additional personnel, also make sure you put additional benefits because if you're hiring a full-time person, you got to throw that in there too. You don't want to skip and then get caught with egg on your face. You're looking for more money. If if we hire another person, the fifty thousand isn't isn't going to cut it. It's going to be a different number. So I think that's a separate conversation that I'll have to have with uh, with Gary. Um, <laughs> But even if it's someone with 25 hours or more that would get benefits, you'd have to have that in there. Just yes. making that comment. Yeah. Oh, Tony, are you talking about the, 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 the new hire or are you talking about the increase in hours to Jesse? No, no, I'm talking the additional personnel. If they hire somebody and they okay. get more than 25 hours, they get benefits. Got it. So you'd All have right. to throw that in the budget too. Yeah, I wanna just make sure, thank you. Well, in light of the importance, and I think the buy-in on social media, we should look at for an increase, Peter. Um, uh, and if you think $2,000 would be a fair way to start, because I agree, we are in tough times and I don't want to give the council a heart attack, but I think in light of what we're trying to do with social media, that would be helpful. Um, do we need to make a motion on that or can we just make it a, we do? Okay. Uh, would someone like to make a motion um, regarding this? Mr. Penelope? Yep. I will make the motion to uh, put the budget up $2,000 more, social media. I'll second. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tony. Um, any comment? All those in favor, say aye. 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 One, two, three, four. It looks universal. <laughs> Uh, we're good there. Thank you, everyone. I think that's uh, money well spent. Peter, anything else to comment on the on budget or any other questions from the commission on budget? Okay, great. Um, town manager, Mr. Manager, your report, sir. Oh, we can go to uh, our town council liaison, um, which is Mr. Pentelo, if you'd be interested. Patrick is, oh, there you are. Maybe, maybe he's talking to Gary. <laughs> I'm back, I'm on. Actually, we were, we Sorry. were. Uh, I'll let Councilor uh, Penelo go first if you'd like. That's fine, either one, Gary. We'll, we'll go in order, how about according to the agenda, so. Cool. Tom um, yeah, so, sorry about that. There's um, some issues going on with our phone systems. Yesterday it was, Police department, as well as several other police departments, today it's now physical services. So we're kind of investigating if it's a frontier issue or something bigger. And that was just our technology people saying, you know, well, we got this back up and running. I um, believe China. Probably. It's all those Russian bots. Um, so I'll, I'll just kind of do it real quick. Um, 
we are, uh, I'll start with COVID. It seems to be the, the question of the day today. Um, I just got the numbers a little bit earlier today. We are uh, significant drop over the last 30, 45 days and what our numbers seem to be averaging. Um, and we are down to 15 um, cases per 100,000, which a month ago we were more like in the 50s, 60s for how many per 100,000 cases per 100,000. So it's been a very significant drop. We're about 15.1 right now. Um, as such, we're starting to have discussions about reopening so that when, if and when the governor says, okay, you can do X, we're already prepared for X. Um, and that obviously ties into our budget season as well because we have to determine, first of all, what um, we had some reductions in last year's budget with not knowing where COVID was gonna take us. So we're kind of hoping we're, um, we've budgeted to the point where if something is able to open, we're able to open it and provide that service to the residents. Um, but also how we forecast our budget going forward in July. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. But as of now, we're, we're trying to come up with plans for reopening. Um, I've already started having conversations with some of those uh, businesses that are kind of an extension of us. And by that, I mean the historical society uh, being able to start using Keeney again and how many people can come in and what the protocols are so that we, again, can, um, can begin using some of these services. Community center, opening up the senior center, although that may be a while. Uh, we've run a few um, uh, small scale um, vaccination sites at the community center or, or uh, appointments at the community center. Social services has done a great job. They, they started um, first with the population 75 and above that we could through our resources here um, isolate and reach out to just to make sure they were getting the shot. If not, we were making it available, but we're only getting it in, you know, 100, 100 doses here or there. Um, so we've kind of been creative with how we put those out. We have done 75 and above, we've done 65 and above, um, and we've slowly moved down that list. I don't believe we've started the 55 yet because we are not a main site, um, but we are getting some in there. Um, engineer, just from a, a department standpoint, engineering is out there running as this weather starts to change like this, although it does look like a 50% chance of snow next week. Um, I love New England. Um, but uh, as the weather starts to change, we have a number of things that happen first. We have to start getting fields ready. But on the flip side, from a, from a um, just a response level, uh, we also look at flooding issues that begin to happen as the snow melts, not only locally, but also up north. It starts to run its way down here and cause flooding issues. And then it freezes over and it causes ice, ice issues and expansion. <laughs> Engineering's out there um, kind of evaluating drainage issues throughout town. Um, uh, they do have about $4 million worth of projects that they're going to try to get done in the next 12 months. Uh, we've got a large influx of funding from the state level to address a number of issues. So it's, it's great. It's a large amount of money. It's also a lot of projects. And up until about a month ago, we were down to one person in engineering due to retirement. So we're trying to fill spots and still provide the services to the residents, uh, which includes road improvements, drainage improvements, uh, stormwater issues that we're addressing and sidewalk repairs. As part of the sidewalk repairs uh, conversation, there's something called slab jacking, which um, sounds uh, exactly what it is. They go into a slab, they drill holes in it, and they uh, put a, like a home expansion spray in it to try to level off sidewalks. And it's an alternative to actually having property owners and the town rip up the sidewalks to replace with new. Um, if a slab costs, I don't know, 250 bucks to replace a slab, this is closer to 100 bucks. Uh, and it's done quicker and with less concern about actually, um, you know, someone's walking by putting a footprint in there. So we're looking to make that available. It was available 10 years, a decade ago, um, but advancements weren't as great. Um, now the formula that they use, the expansion foam is much better. And we're trying to bring that back to not only save the taxpayers when we have to do it, but also if you are a taxpayer and you're looking to, um, to improve your sidewalks. Uh, it doesn't work in all cases, but it's a good alternative. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, Parks and Rec, as a Parks and Rec physical services have started their process to reopen when they can uh, and what they can, which again, um, this time of year, there's a lot of repair that goes on to um, not only roadway and cleaning out catch basins, but also to um, 
around the park area where we might have used equip heavy equipment to push snow. Uh, there's always stuff torn turn up. So we obviously, as part of economic development, beautification is a big part of that. So we want to address it uh, while we can. Two, two, three, four. Um, so budget, we've talked, I've already talked a little bit about, obviously I support the economic development concept and trying to support Peter and this group as much as we can. There are a lot of competing interests and obviously I'm always watching where our revenues are from last year, uh, what we may or may lose from the state level and what costs have gone up. Uh, but obviously I, as the town manager, I wanna make sure we're making recommendations that help the cause as best we can. The council always has a tough decision to make. I do not envy them. It's easy enough for me to produce a budget that I think is valuable. Um, it's much more difficult for them because there are a lot of competing um, uh, issues that take place. Both they have to look at the Board of Education budget and what's being requested, which uh, Board of Ed gave their budget presentation last night. Uh, I have asked them to attend the council meeting on Monday, which hopefully uh, Mike Emmett will be able to. Uh, but if not, he'll do another one of the other uh, meetings. He'll he'll um, review his budget. Um, on the budget standpoint, I've met with every department with the exception of one, as I mentioned. Um, so I'm trying to pull that all together. We're still waiting for information from our pension. Our uh, actuaries have to come up and tell us where our accounts are to see if we have to invest more in our pension or OPEB. Um, but uh, we are working through that. Um, as part of that conversation, um, I've been having meetings over the last several months with the town managers of Newington, Rocky Hill, Berlin, and Cromwell to see if there's any shared services opportunity, whether it's equipment, personnel, um, just to see if there's some cost savings, not just bidding with each other, but also sharing, um, uh, you know, again, equipment's a big one. Um, right now we do share some equipment with Rocky Hill, um, which helps drive down our costs, uh, but uh, there's other opportunities in there. Some things as simple as our animal control officer works both for Newington part-time and for Wethersfield part-time. Um, there's no reason why we couldn't figure out a way to, um, to share that person officially rather than, oh, you're only a few days here and a few days there and we have holes, let's share them and they can go back and forth. So there's some hopeful savings there. We have gone out to see if um, from an insurance standpoint, we're always looking to get the best pricing for health insurance. We have a lot of employees between the town and Board of Ed side. There's a cost to the taxpayer uh, for carrying those costs and we're always trying to um, shop and get the best rates available. Other things outside of our control rel related to the budget, uh, which have happened in the last 40, well, let's say in the last week. Uh, the first is that uh, Mira, which is where we bring our trash, to be um, weighted and then disposed of, um, has uh, officially noted that they will be closing um, approximately July 2022, which means we're gonna lose our trash facility. Uh, so we know that there's gonna be some significant costs incurred. Um, the state through Department of Energy and Environmental Protection or DEEP uh, about six months ago started a, a a group of, uh, and I don't want to get too into de details, Pat, uh, Councillor Penelo, in case I'm stealing some of your thunder, but um, they, they have had four committees. They did a presentation to the council on Monday. Um, Pat, if you need me to expand when you talk, I'm more than happy to. I won't go into it right now. Uh, but basically, we're looking at cost saving measures, which um, hopefully we can bring to the taxpayer, if not for this year, for next. But we are looking at an increase of, uh, uh, God. $12 plus or minus per ton. We do about 10, might be more than $12, but we do about 10,000 tons a year. So it, it could be a sizable increase to the taxpayer um, in the next 12 months while that facility goes off site. So we're, we're trying to dig in now to see where we can save. Uh, also part of those costs that we not, cannot control within the budget, we have an ad valorem tax for our sewer cost, that's really a pass through to the taxpayer. So rather than MDC charging each taxpayer individually for, um, for sewer, uh, like they do for water, they just come up with a calculation that determines, okay, cost for the town of Wethersfield is gonna be X, the cost for the town of West Hartford is gonna be Y, um, and those eight member communities kind of hold the burden for all. Um, and there was a study that started about a, uh, two years ago now, 
uh, to analyze if there's different methods of charging that might actually alleviate some of the cost to the taxpayer. This uh, survey came up, or this uh, analysis came up with five potential solutions. Um, and right now we're in the process of reviewing those five. Um, there are, could be some considerable savings for the taxpayer, um, at least through the budget process that we're hoping for. Of course, those get eaten up somewhere, so I'm sure NBC will find a way to get the resident directly. I, I'm saying that with a smile because I, I don't know what they're going to do, but that's always my assumption is you're, one way or another, you're gonna pay, you're gonna pay now or pay later. Um, but we're hoping to try to bring those costs down measurably. Uh, and other things, kind of points of interest to hit up. Um, Social Justice Coalition is having another meeting on March, trying to my calendar, March 15th. Um, they've had several meetings along the way. We've, we're actually moving uh, kind of at a very fast pace now, uh, building these relationships. We've divided the group, which is anywhere between 90 to like 120 people who show up to these conversations into two main um, uh, topical groups, one that addresses community engagement through the acknowledgement of racism and other biases in the community and encourages collective action to determine what success looks like. Um, and then the second is to establish spaces for community members to engage in courageous dialogues and develop the skills to navigate interracial and intercultural interactions in a supportive environment. And again, we're using uh, a results-based accountability method. Uh, the short and sweet on that is you start with the end in mind. What is it that the perfect let's say the perfect community looks like, let's work backwards on what those outcomes are. And then you create the activities that you need to do and those action items that you need to do in order to achieve those. And you try to measure the change, uh, change in behavior, attitude, circumstance, knowledge, and skills. Um, the, uh, while those two overarching um, uh, topics don't, uh, are very overwhelming, they are overarching. So within those, there's subcommittees built out to kind of address um, issues of uh, bias and uh, microaggressions and just basically creating an open dialogue of understanding uh, from both sides. It's, it's, uh, it's been a great process. Um, other things of interest, uh, Brainerd wrote, is Judy back on? I hate talking about Brainerd without her in the room. Uh, but Brainerd Airport uh, has, is going through a process through DEEP to get permission to do some clear cutting and selective cutting of trees that are, some of them are in town right away in town property. Others are part of a conservation easement. Um, uh, there's no, I, there's limited information that I can give right now, not because I'm withholding anything, just because I don't have it, but we do have a commitment from both Deep and Brainerd uh, Airport Authority that they won't, they can't and won't move forward until they have more public dialogue so they're aware of what's going on. But um, I wanna keep everyone in the loop of that one because it's gonna be, um, it's going to be a battle. Um, I don't mean that in a negative way, but I just know they're going to want to cut X and there's going to be a lot of outcry about that. Keisha Farm, just to touch on it quickly, I see Brooke, I want to follow up on something Brooke and Marco were talking about in terms of engaging youth. Uh, we have engaged, as I've mentioned before, the University of Hartford um, to, uh, because of limited funding uh, during the year, rather than hiring a consultant, we've consulted out to the University of Hartford and giving some students an opportunity to get creative with um, and build experience doing community, uh, community engagement, community development projects while helping bring the town through a dialogue as to what Keisha Farms might be able to be uh, repurposed for, reused for, or considered for. Um, they haven't, I don't know if we've officially launched the revised Facebook page, but they will be working on it, posting soon. I do think it's a great opportunity for both the students at the University of Hartford to kind of measure all their training and, and match it up with actual real life experience. But I also would love to see a connection between the high school youth and Miss Coco's class and the University of Hartford and building that relationship. So these guys have a, a can see a pathway for a career. Um, as they walk out the door and you know what they consider when they leave high school, where can I go and what can I do? And that's probably more than enough information. Any questions for the group? Does that conclude, Mr. Mr. Manager? Uh, it's probably more than enough. Yes. Okay. Councillor Pentelo. 
Yeah, um, uh, the town manager pretty much knocked out uh, probably 90% of my list. So I'll make this uh, really free. That's why every time you go, Gary, I just sort of laugh. I just... <laughs> we should talk before. I, we, yeah. We should. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, as as the town manager just said, it's you know it's budget season, so I'm definitely looking forward to working with the council as well as the manager and hearing from the superintendent of the board of ed to, to get this budget adopted through 2022. Gary, I don't think you mentioned the spring paving program, so maybe I'll just touch on that. Um, at uh, spring paving paving program, as crazy as it, we may have uh, snow next week, but that's set to begin soon. Um, I believe it's starting in the Jordan Lane area, uh, Jordan Lane area. So uh, council voted last month to approve the bid. So uh, Gary, do you have an exact date when that's supposed to start? Uh, I don't. So what you're going to find out on Monday, oh. was, try not to tell uh, the counselors stuff and like, you know, keep them blindsided. But what we found out yesterday uh, during agenda setting is that um, the, the bid that you approved, the state has carved out um, Tilcon's component in terms of reclamation. So we may have to bid that out separately now. I'm waiting to get approval to piggyback on someone else's bid so you don't have to approve it. Okay. But I need kind of the chain of command on that. With any luck, you know, if we have to go out to bid, you're pushing it out another two, three weeks before we start. Yeah. Okay. Well, that kind of took the wind out of my sail. So I'll just... way, you'd have no way of knowing that. It, just, <laughs> it literally just happened yesterday at about three o'clock. <laughs> so I'll turn it back over to the chairman. Thank you, Councillor Penelo, for that uh, extremely um, uh, minor con contribution. Uh, uh, great. Thank you very much. Uh, between the both of you, we feel very comfortable. Um, that's, that's my fault. Sorry, Pat. Problem. Um, Councillor, uh, excuse me, uh, Chairman Oikel or George Oikel, would you please uh, step forward? You're on uh, mute. Uh, you're on mute, Mr. Oikel. Clip up and uh, click up inside your box, George, and you'll see a, uh, or at the bottom, you can see an unmute button. Should be bottom okay, left. There, it is. there you go. Okay. Uh, and what your question again, please? Uh, no question. We're just uh, requesting your report. Okay. Sir. Well, I'm glad to be here, and I went. I should have attended more of your meetings in the recent past. I volunteered to uh, be a P and Z representative to you folks, and uh, I learned a lot hearing the town manager and and others, and uh, even the Lenoshi property and the old Weathersfield was. Had, I had interest hearing that and uh, interesting vote. And uh, so I, I, I got a lot out of the meeting and uh, I appreciate being here and I'll make sure I get back again when you meet. Great, anything from the PNZ that would be a highlight that, that would be of interest? I'll say one more thing, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you're doing uh, work on, you know, you're, you're hoping for the Silas Dean work and uh, going out to find a consultants for that. We hope to do redo our, our plan of development. And uh, there's one more, right, Peter? And uh, that uh, we hope to do. And uh, I hope all of that goes well and the financing is there. I'm sure it will be. Great. Mark, just a real quick, uh, the, the PNZ did, uh, there's a parcel of open space in the Great Meadows that uh, the town is um, um, put put out to bid uh, or put out for proposal. So the Planning and Zoning Commission recommended uh, that the council uh, go forward with that. So um, there's a, a piece of property in the Meadows that we acquired back in the early 70s as part of the interstate uh, construction. Uh, it's sitting there landlocked. Uh, both the Game Club and the Great Meadows Conservation Trust have an interest in it. So uh, it was given a positive referral to the council for them to decide. And then the only other two things to mention, which I did mention earlier on uh, at the first meeting in April, April 6th, the brewery proposed brewery regulations will have a public hearing. And then additionally, um, 
not the most exciting subject, but uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission is revising their regulations regarding fences. We've had some recent controversy with fences, believe it or not, and uh, those are uh, those regulations are being changed a little bit. So that will also be heard uh, at the meeting in April. Thank you, Peter, for that. Sure. Appreciate that comment. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Oikel. Um, Peter, I know Judy had a step away and wanted to, you to, to, to speak uh, regarding the, um, uh, the shopkeepers May event. Sure. So the shopkeepers um, recently have decided that um, they, they want to do a springtime event that is, um, you know, COVID safe. Uh, so it would be an outside event. It would be the springtime equivalent of the Scarecrows event in the fall. Uh, this event will be focused on, uh, it's going to be called Bicycles on Main. So they're going to ask the community to step up and decorate a variety of different bicycles, have them on display up and down Main Street. Yeah, obviously, it goes hand in hand with some of the work that's being done elsewhere in the community with you know, the bicycle and pedestrian plan and the Bike Walk Weathersfield group. So they are gearing up for that. It would be uh, during the entire month of May. So if you have a bicycle uh, sitting around your house and you want to uh, decorate it and enter it into the uh, Bicycles on Main event, uh, please uh, think about that. They're putting together uh, the um, application forms and they're gearing up for the marketing of that. But as um, soon as we have that information, we will uh, share it with everybody. But I wanted to put that on your uh, horizon. So that's taking up uh, a bit of, uh, bit of the Heritage Tourism Commission's time. Great, thanks, Pete. Um, is our chamber is Deb? Are you with us? I don't think she's on the call. I had sent her an email again about it, but okay. I see somebody that dialed in on a phone number eight four one seven four two four. I don't know who that might be, um, but that's obviously not Deb. Okay, uh, I have nothing to report as chairman. Um, subcommittee reports. I know we've had a marketing uh, meeting uh, as of late and financial strategies as well. Um, anything, Peter, we should be focused on? I know from marketing communications, Tom and uh, Marco uh, have got you know a good lead on that. Do we need to schedule something? Or Tom and Marco, do you uh, feel a meeting is required? Anything that we can do collectively? Um, not necessarily collectively as a full, a large group. Um, Tom, myself, I think Joy and Brooke need to put our heads together and, and you know, I think uh, kind of get some of those things started with both, I think, um, the university, as Brooke mentioned, and also um, with Weathersfield Eye. Joy and Brooke, anything to share regarding that? Nope, I'm good. Great. That's it for now. Okay, thanks, Joy. Um, great. Um, if you guys want to take a moment and review the minutes, um, carefully prepared by Don Guy. Any questions or comments regarding our minutes from our last meeting? Do the motion to approve? Motion to approve. Thank you, uh, Mr. Martino. Second? Second. Uh, th thank you, Brooke. All those in favor, please say something or raise your hand. All good. I think we're good there. Um, all right. Our next meeting is Thursday, April 8th. I hope there'll be no snow in the forecast at that point. Um, I hope that most of you will have your vaccinations uh, by then. Who here has been vaccinated? I got my, I got one. Everybody, anybody? I got one getting two. All right, you're in? All right, well, uh, everybody stay healthy and happy. I have nothing else to add. Um, I'm uh, all those in favor on concluding our meeting, turn off your computer. Thanks guys. Peace. Thanks everyone. Uh, nice job, Mark. Bye everyone.